to be a good one. So first, as he comes up onto the stage, I'd like to introduce Kevin Cheveldayoff. Perfect timing. He served as the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets since 2011. Prior to his time in Winnipeg, he spent two years with the Chicago Blackhawks, acting as the assistant general manager and senior director of hockey operations, helping them win the Stanley Cup in 2010. He also spent 12 seasons as the GM of the AHL Chicago Wolves, guiding the team to four league championships. Gil Scott, he has been representing professional athletes since 1979. He was the first Canadian contract advisor to be certified by the NFLPA, and he's negotiated over 300 contracts in his career. So he's done NFL, but also for NHL, he's done GMs and coaches, which is quite interesting. And lastly, Anton Thun is a certified NHL player agent and the co-managing director at M5 Sports. He earned his law degree from the University of Western Ontario. Great school. And he became a partner in a Toronto-based law firm, which he resigned from in 95 to focus his time on managing professional athletes. And the moderator for negotiating player contracts, Brian Burke. And by the way, you're getting too much Brian Burke this day because we had one person (laughs) cancel. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to listen to me so much. And I'm sorry I interrupted on the last panel, but that was bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I was there. (laughs) Okay, so... Talk about negotiating player contracts. These guys are not just experts. They're all my friends. I've known them for many years, negotiated against Anton, negotiated against Gil for players, and tried to make deals with Kevin unsuccessfully. (laughs) Kevin has the record for longest period as a GM without a player for player deal in history, (laughs) but he's been busy since then. So let's start. So we'll start with you, Kevin. So my feeling with with the team was, the key to a success, the, the key to have any chance of a successful negotiation is the first offer, where you don't want to piss the player off, you want to come in. What's your thinking on that? Well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be here today and uh, the opportunity to speak to everyone, it's, uh, it's exciting. So, um, again, it is an interesting question because it's something that, uh, yeah, you know, chances are you're starting off a relationship or, or something like that and, and you want to make sure that if you are going to make uh, you know the, the offer that it makes sense it's got to make sense to you and it's got to make sense to uh, you know to the other party um, I think it really comes down to the research that you do prior to it um, and and again the the justification behind that offer now it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get it done um, but if uh, you know again I think both sides you know, in, in today's day and age, you know, knows that uh, you know, no one's you know, going to try to to win and successfully have a, a you know win a, a negotiation outright and successfully have a relationship that's going to last you know for years and years. So um, I think you have to uh, you know do the research. It's got to make some sense. And certainly, if you're dealing with um, uh, entry level contracts versus you know you unrestricted free agent contracts. Um, you know, there, there is a level of, of projection that does have to go in. So um, it really comes down to your homework and, and understanding that uh, when you're negotiating that first deal, um, you know, you, you're obviously trying to do it for a, for a long-term relationship. And Anton, tell the people in the audience a couple of players you represent and then your thoughts on... Sure. Uh, we've got clients like Patrice Bergeron, Chris Letang, Brian Little, who plays for Chevy in, in Winnipeg, Andrew Cogliano, Dar- Darnell Nurse, among others, TJ Brody in Calgary. Um, in, and, I, and I think Kevin's right to a certain degree in, in, in terms of negotiating a deal. At the, at the end of the day, we're all businessmen and we're trying to maximize the value for our client. And, and Kevin's client is the Winnipeg Jets, and Mr. Chipman is his boss, who, who uh, uh, to some extent, is going to give Kevin a budget, uh, whether that budget is at the cap or not at the cap. And, and I've got a client who plays in a marketplace that is a cap system in the National Hockey League right now. I, I think the variety of things that come into play are not just even specific to whether you've got an entry-level player, a restricted free agent, or a UFA player. It's really who that player is and how does that player fit into the system. So uh, at the end of the day, I believe there's always a marketplace for a particular player. And depending on who that player is, let's say it's Brian Little, who I did a deal with uh, with uh, Larry Simmons, Kevin's uh, assistant general manager last summer. At the end of the day, there's a marketplace for a player of Brian's ability. And the spread on that marketplace, depending on other players that have signed, might be as little as $250,000 or might be as much as a million for that matter. And my job as an agent is to maximize Brian's value and to achieve the highest 
level possible. So I want to be at the high end of that. And from a business standpoint, Kevin wants to be at the low end of that. I fully understand that. And, and that's the range that we're in. And 99.9% .9 of contracts end up being in that range, whether it's the high end of the range, the middle of the range, or the, or the low end of the range. The one exception to that rule, I think, is when you have um, a player of unbelievable exceptional ability who is now going to break the mold of what the model is. And that player could be Wayne Gretzky. He could be Connor McDavid. And I think here in Toronto, one of the things that we're seeing um, with the Toronto Maple Leafs and the, the Willie Nylander negotiations is what is the marketplace because the mold for players coming out of the entry level system that has existed historically, um, which I think most people would say is somewhere between the six to seven million dollar range on a longer term deal and that's what Mark Shifley did in Winnipeg, David Pasternak did in, in, in Boston. The mold got broken a little bit last summer uh, when Connor McDavid, who is no, you know, notably probably the best player in hockey or among the best, did a $12.5 million deal coming out of the entry level system. And his teammate, who nobody would necessarily compare to Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, did a contract worth $8.5 million. So did that reset the marketplace or are those exceptions to the rules? Did they break the mold or is the mold still the same? And that's the debate that's going on in Toronto. Willie Nylander thinks the marketplace got reset. The Leafs are saying it didn't get reset. Those are exceptions to the rule. And now we're going to see what, what reset there is in the marketplace. Okay, Gil, your thoughts? Well, I think uh, the reason you have this situation is because so many leagues now are salary cap driven. When it wasn't a salary cap league, uh, negotiations were different. But today, it's getting your slice of the pie. So Kevin, as a general manager, only has you know a certain piece of the pie that he can spend on everybody, and that's clearly the Nylander deal in Toronto right now, because they got to get Marner signed, they got to get Matthews signed. We all understand that, and they're trying to figure out how much can they spend on this guy and still get those other deals done. So when you're in a, a salary cap system where there is a limit on what you can spend, uh, you, you can't necessarily get more than you think you're going to get. So If I can just add to that, Gil, I, I yeah. think what ends up happening, and this is probably, Sheffy probably understands this better than we do, and so does Brian because he's been on management side in this cap system, is the, the significance of every decision you make impacting on another decision. So right now the Leafs are in a predicament, not because they don't have cap space, but because they may not have the appropriate cap space and they may not want to set the precedent of, of signing Willie Nylander to a particular dollar value because they have uh, Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews and Jake Gardner and potentially Freddie Anderson in a few years that they have to resign. And you're slicing that salami and you're trying to decide how many slices and how thick the slice is going to be for all of these players. The predicament that nobody talks about is that some of the predicament that has been created has in fact been created by the Leafs. And the reason for that is they decided, not incorrectly or correctly, to sign um, Patrick Marlowe two years ago and he now has another year on a contract which impacts going forward. And then the Leafs made the decision to accelerate their development process by signing an outstanding player by the name of Johnny Tavares, who now eats up $11 million of their cap space, which they now can't allocate to Willie Nylander or Austin Matthews or Mitch Marner or Jake Gardner or Freddie Anderson. So it's all interconnected. It's a much more complicated world. And it's almost like playing chess on four or five different levels at the same time. And that's the challenge that Kevin Sheveldayoff has. And we as agents have to fit our players into that system while trying to maximize their value at the same time. So that goes back to the opening offer, which was the question. So you're sitting there and whether you have entry levels and they're maybe a little bit more, you know, systemic in that, you know, they're, uh, you know, where you get drafted, you know, maybe the offer, you know, becomes a certain thing. Is there bonuses in their bonuses? But that's where the projection comes into play when you're talking about um, whether it's even in your second contract or your third contract. If there's RFA years, if there's UFA years, you have to project. So Anton's 100% correct is that, you know, decisions that you make today, um, you know, again, part of a job of a general manager is you have to have kind of panoramic vision. You can't, 
you know, you can't just focus on the now 100%. You have to focus on the, the now, the, the short-term future, and the long-term future because in a cap world, in an uncertain cap world, um, the decisions that you do make today, um, you know, will have, you know, a long-reaching effect. So that's why going back to that opening offer, you know, I feel comfortable making an opening offer when I do know, um, I, again, if I can sit here and justify, look, this is what I think this offer is, and this is why. And I may have individual circumstances that, you know, that, that pertain to me, you know, the Winnipeg Jets that, um, you know, Team X or Team Y don't. But sitting here today, this is why I can offer you this and feel good about it and justify it. So it's not like I'm trying to outright win, but I'm trying to tell you and explain a story uh, and, and paint the picture of what we might have to be facing. I think the other, the other thing that's important is the agent needs to understand when he has the hammer and when the club has the hammer. There are different times in negotiation life, life cycles of a player where the player ultimately has the hammer if he's an unrestricted free agent. And you know, to maximize a player's dollar, you may go to another city to do that. And, uh, but you gotta know when to hold them and when to fold them. And when you don't have the leverage and the club has the leverage, like in the earlier years, when the player's younger and he's restricted, then you have to kind of go along with uh, their slicing up the pie the way they want to do it to a certain degree because they have the hammer at that point. And, and, and Gil, to that point, I think one of the things that I found um, with athletes is th the lack of understanding of where an athlete fits into a system and where he actually achieves success uh, rather than where he believes he can achieve success. And free agency is the perfect uh, situation today where you have players and teams make monumental mistakes based on what a team believes a player can do and what a player believes he can do. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll give you an example, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm ripping on any, any particular players. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, this goes back to one of the franchises you used to be with, Berkey, in, in well, Anaheim. Go ahead and rip them. <laughs> no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to rip them, but you, you, the, the mainstays in, in Anaheim, to my mind, in the last few years, uh, and maybe it's now getting to the end of their careers, have been Ryan Getzlaff and Corey Perry. Two very, very talented hockey players who have played on a line together for the most part, the first line in Anaheim, and they've had a series of left wingers who have rotated in over those years from Dustin Penner to Patrick Maroon to... Um, Dustin Penner, that's a good one, Berkey, remember that? Yeah, so. Well, no, no, <laughs> but, but um, to a, a young guy, uh, Bolesky, I think, that signed with the Bruins, um, and so on and so forth. I think there was somebody else. Um, and, and to make a long story short, they, prospered playing on that line because they were big bodied guys who uh, who complemented the two guys on that line and were very very successful and got to free agency and in each instance they decided or in most of those instances I don't know if they were all free agents decided that because of the success they had in Anaheim they could trans that success to the Edmonton Oilers or the Boston Bruins and achieve significant dollars by going into the free agent marketplace. And in each of the instances, they went to a place, it didn't work out, they eventually got traded or sent to the minors uh, and didn't achieve the success that they want. So one of the things that I think we all have to be careful about is having a real understanding that of how we actually fit into the system. and. Um, free agency, unrestricted free agency, really tells a great story about who really has a good handle on on the hockey world in terms of, you know, a player believing he's X and it turning out that he's Y, and a and a team believing that a player is X and, and Y. Well, to explain what you're talking about, the range, Anton. When you go into arbitration for a player, you use a computer to spit out a fil you put filters on and say, okay, we're doing a center who's the right shot scored between 40 and 50 points in each of the last two years and had 75 penalty minutes or more. It spits out four or five names and their salaries, and that's the range. That's, that's what I consider to be the range. That's what the agent says is the range. He's going to pick the highest salary on there. I'm going to pick the lowest, but we're going to make a deal as long as we're both in there. So that's where I, where I think the first offer is key, and it's not what you said that Kevin has an in interest in getting the player at the lowest salary. I've never tried to get a player at the lowest salary pre-cap. It was like, I want him mm -hmm. at the cheapest fair number. I want him to feel good about the deal. 
But now on a hard cap system, you're right. I want every penny I can save. Right. I want to. the lowest yeah. number on that range. Yeah. And if I can get below it, I'm going to. Yeah. 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 You have the system dictates that. Yeah. So where, where do you see this going? Do you guys think the system works? You've got massive cap problems because you've had success. You've drafted great. You traded great. Your coach does a good job. Your coach even does really good interviews. And, and <laughs> now you got cap trouble. The, I, the amusing thing is we got a cap issue here in Toronto, and the team hasn't won anything. Why don't we just eliminate all the caps? <laughs> well, I, I'm going to comment on that because I sent a, a text message a couple of days ago to one of my friends in the media when he was on TV, and they were talking about the cap. And my comment to him was, isn't it interesting that the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to be the first team that's going to have to take apart their team without having won the Stanley Cup? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and that's because of the cap. Um, and, and, and again, it comes. It, it's not solely because of the cap. It's it's because of the decisions that the club made within the cap structure. And so I, uh, again, uh, you the know, comment I, that I got back from the, that gentleman was, yeah, but would you not have ever would you not have signed Johnny Tavares if he wants to come to Toronto? And the question to me, or my response back was, if he wasn't part of my plan in the first place, I would not have signed him. If he was part of the plan in the first place, I would. Because if you're developing your players, and Kevin's done a great job of developing players within the, the context of the, the uh, Winnipeg Jets, but if you're actually developing your players, you may have to delay that success that you're going to have to determine uh, to not get Johnny Tavares and be the, the Leafs that they are today in anticipation of two years from now and seven years from now over a five-year period of time being able to keep Marner, Matthews, Kapanen, Gardner all on top of Johnny Tavares. And Johnny Tavares, as good as he is, may be the reason why the Leafs can't keep those guys. And I'm not blaming Johnny. That was a Leaf decision. But, you know, I, and I do believe, obviously, teams make their own decisions. But, you know, in a league where you are, you know, dealt with comparables, and like Berkey said, it, and he's 100% accurate, like you go to the computer, it spits it out, there it is. But if, if one guy, you know, again, uh, he, there's also the other side of it where, um, you know, there's going to be some outliers. And, and the outliers sometimes, you know, skew the, you know, the league and skew the cap system, you know, to the point where, you know, it does make it difficult to, uh, you know, to, to kind of keep those players, um, you know, again, because, you know, is it the exception or is it the rule? You know, so when I'm arguing with Anton or I'm arguing with Gil, um, you know, with respect to, you know, they're, they're representing individuals, I'm representing a collective group. I'm representing the pie. I got to fit it into this pie. They're trying to get that biggest slice. So they're going to try to go, you know, to that outlier and say, well, that's, that's the rule. That's not the exception. And I'm going to try and argue and say, well, no, that, that's not. So, well, um, we're you know, it's the new rule, Kevin. What's that? It's, it's always the new rule. We, we oh, just your, created a new rule. Your nightmare is when he does it once. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the nightmare is, is when the guy does it one time and now he's up. Yeah. And the agent's saying, well, he's a 30 goal scorer. And you're saying he was 18 and 16 the last two years. What do you mean he's a 30 goal scorer? Well, that's 34. He's a 20. <laughs> 18 and 16. That's 34. What do you mean? Yeah. Well, we had it with with uh, with Kuhlman here. Yeah. He got 29 goals, and we thought, geez, we got a 30 goal scorer. We paid him like that for four years. Yeah. He never touched the teens again. Yeah. So, anyway, there's outliers, but that's basically the framework how it's done. What do you think? How consistent or inconsistent is it to have salary arbitration and a hard salary cap system? Well, I, I think it's almost essential to have it in a, in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a salary cap system because the, the dilemma that you run into in this system is what's happened here in Toronto. If you don't have arbitration, you, you're going to run into a lot of situations where players are sitting out, and that is very, very disruptive to the system. Um, so as much as arbitration is a somewhat new factor in the last few uh, collective bargaining agreements and it wasn't in place that... Uh, you know, we, we've gone from free agency being at 31 to free agency in 32 to free agency being at 27. Uh, and arbitration basically being for 24, 25, and 26 year olds. It's not really relevant to elsewhere. I, I think what it does is it creates some consistency to the system and it might be a little bit of glue that allows you to get deals done when you might otherwise have controversies because the reality of it is those 23 or 24, 25, and 26 year olds more often are going to be the best players on your team. And if you don't have the ability to control them uh, through arbitration, I think that creates a huge problem. Well, yeah, well, I think it's entirely inconsistent with the hard cap system that, because really the arbitrator's picking this player's dough goes to this player if it's a cap team. 
he's allocating money within the cap. I think it's inconsistent. I, I see what you say, and actually a couple of managers have told me that. Yeah. When I was getting ready for this panel, they were like, well, we don't mind it. As long as it's allocated fairly, I don't see there, there being a bit of a problem. If the, if the arbitrator gives a terrible award one way or the other, then it's not allocated fairly. So that's and where things obviously, like this past summer, we had seven players that were eligible for arbitration. So you're you're going in, you have a couple of guys that you want to do to extensions. You know, we we're very fortunate to, uh, you know, to sign Blake Wheeler to an extension, but, but I had to go to Blake Wheeler even, you know, at the beginning of the summer and say, look, Blake, we're, I want to sign you, we're going to sign you, we're going to get this done. But I got to figure out all these seven guys because you know what? I'm not making the choice in some of these things. I'm not saying is it one million? Is it three million? You know, is it somewhere in the middle for some of these guys with arbitration? So in a hard cap world, you know, it, it does uh, you know give you some some pause and some some anxiety when you know someone else is uh, you know is obviously uh, potentially dictating um, you know what those numbers are going to be. But but Kevin, yeah, uh, I would suggest to you though, even when you had that conversation with with Blake Wheeler, or if you have it with somebody else. You've still got a pretty fundamentally good idea, unless you haven't done your homework, and I know you guys do, of what that range is going to be, right? So you can you can go to Blake Wheeler and say, I've got three guys that I've got to get done, and you know it's going to impact either zero on my negotiation with you, or it's going to impact at a five hundred thousand dollar per player impact with you. Right. Um, so that's the range. I I I think the system is so well defined in our world today that um, we don't get too, too many surprises. You, you get an, a bad arbitration decision once in a while, either for the player or against the player. Um, but for the most part, 98% of the deals are within the range or close to the range, and we don't have too many surprises. And in the NFL, we don't have arbitration for player salaries, so. I like the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he likes it because then you can just cut the player when he doesn't perform either. <laughs> yeah, so. but they got a lot of things in there. Yeah. Yeah. CBA's got a lot of things that management has right. a lot of rights. It's right. uh, it's pretty good for teams. So, what do you? What, what's your sense on the two issues that I think the public would see and owners would see in this collective bargaining agreement would be that are not working for us. Still in my old role, would be the salary term or the contract terms and the signing bonuses. Now, these are both issues that the league tried hard to negotiate down before they agreed to these. It was When I left the negotiations, it was five-year max on a contract term and 10% cap on signing bonuses. Now there's no cap or 90% or whatever, no cap, and then eight-year contract term. Where does, that, where does that sit with you, Chevy? Well, you know, again, I think it's uh, it comes down to your own personal uh, teams, you know, philosophies and stuff like that. We've not been a team that has uh, given out signing bonuses, um, you know, on a on a larger scale. So it's 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 kind of a non-starter for us, right? When we, uh, you know, right when we get started. But um, you know, again, would you, would you explain that to, to why why signing bonuses with the labor possible labor dispute? Well, it, it's partially, you know, uh, again, there's, uh, whether there's going to be a, you know, labor disruption or not, you know, obviously, you know, who knows uh, what the, what's in the cards there moving forward. But, you know, when you sign when you sign a player and they get a signing bonus, they essentially get it, um, you know, at the beginning of the summer or whenever you negotiate it in. But that, you know, that money becomes theirs, um, you know, regardless of, of, of what's going on. So, uh, again, it's just been more of a philosophy within our organization that we, um, you know, we haven't given it. And, and uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, been steadfast on. So John Tavares is $11 million a year, $1 million in base salary, and $10 million in signing bonus. So on July 1st, he gets $10 million. So if season after next, there is a work stoppage, right. he gets 10 of his $11 million right. paid. It's got to be paid before the lockout. Yeah. And the other players get zero for as long as the lockout continues. Right. I'm not sure it's equitable that star players can collect money during a work stoppage and the, the grunts like me can't. Well, it's, it's, what, it's what I said earlier, it's who's got the hammer. And in that particular situation, when you have three or four or five clubs after him, his agent had the hammer in that case. Uh, to Brian, that firstly, kind of a deal. Brian, you're a star. Don't, don't, don't worry about it, you're a star. But you, uh, never, uh, you never saw me play. No, well, everyone, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about as a businessman. You know, everyone, a everyone thinks I was a defenseman, but I wasn't. I just looked <laughs> stupid and I had terrible stats. Big and slow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it, the, the, the signing bonus component that you talk about is, has a number of factors. So, so the first part of the signing bonus component that Brian's talking about, uh, I, I think you were alluding to, is getting signing bonus um, 
during a year when there is potentially a lockout because essentially that signing bonus is guaranteed money. And just to go to Gil's point, again, that's part of the leverage, that's part of the negotiation. That might in fact have been the determining factor between the Leafs and San Jose, although right. it probably wasn't, uh, because the Leafs were willing to guarantee Johnny Tavares money over a particular period of term, and that included the lockout years. Um, the other is just having a signing bonus, um, the signing bonus element, because at the end of the day, the contracts that players sign are not guaranteed. They're guaranteed to the extent of two thirds of the uh, base salary plus the signing bonus. So when you have a signing bonus component for Johnny T, for example, if, if his contract is one million in salary plus $10 million in signing bonus, and it won't happen, but he gets bought out, he'll get that $10 million. Explain the buyout, Anton. Yeah. I so assume the, the people here don't understand what that okay. means. So, uh, let's, let's say we've got a contract for $3 million and it's got one year left to go uh, because that's probably the simplest example. The, the, the CBA will say if, if, if I've got that contract and Kevin wants to buy me out, which is probably very, very likely if I'm playing for Kevin, uh, he'll come to me and say, hey, listen, Anton, you haven't been performing very well. We need your cap space because there's some guy named Patrick Line who might just be better than you. I don't really believe that. but might just be better than you um, and we need the cap space so what will happen is they'll provide me a notification uh, I'll end up probably getting waived through the league for that matter um, and my contract will be got out so I've got a three million dollar contract for next year the 1920 season which I've now been told is being bought out which essentially means that I don't get three million dollars I will actually get two-thirds of that because that's what the NHLPA uh, negotiated in terms of the standard player contract, and I will get that two-thirds paid out over twice the length of the, the term of the contract. So the term was only one year, so twice the length is two years, the buyout is $2 million, I'll get $1 million in the first year, and I'll get $1 million in the second year. Okay. Great, great explanation. Okay. So yeah. Um, so and that, it's, it's one-third for a player under the age of 26. Yes. So yeah, two thirds exactly. for a player, twenty six and over. That's right. My apologies. I, I I didn't state that. So we don't have. It's it's said commonly that we don't that we have guaranteed contracts. The NFL doesn't. We don't technically have guaranteed contracts. Exactly. It's but if the player gets ten million dollars out of eleven on July first, yeah. it's basically buyout. Proof. Well, a hundred percent. And and to use the example that I used, if my salary was uh, one million dollars and ten million dollars of signing bonus that remained. I would get the $10 million signing bonus and the, the base salary of $1 million would now be $666,666.67 um, and that would be spread out over two years. So I would actually get paid $10,666,000 that was owed to me out of the $11 million. So Yeah, and we try not to get too technical here, but we often toss terms around and assume that everyone in the room knows what they mean. So that was an excellent, yeah. excellent explanation. Yeah. Um, so, well, so what about contract term? What do you think about the length of contracts? Well, I, I, listen, I think that at the end of the day, the, 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 the factors that we're talking about, Brian, the signing bonus and the contract term, for the most part, relate specifically to, uh, and, and I haven't done a study, but I really believe that more often than not, and, and I'd say 90% of the cases, the players that are getting that eight-year term or that seven-year term, are the players that probably warrant that term, okay? You're not signing a fourth line guy to an eight year contract or a seven year contract. You're signing him to a one or two year deal. Um, so it's, it's Johnny Tavares that's getting that contract and assuming that Johnny Tavares performs during that contract and earns the signing bonus, I don't believe that there's an issue with that term, okay? Um, and it's the same thing, whether it's a five-year term or a seven-year term or an eight-year term. We used to have 13 and 15-year terms, which honestly are ridiculous because you can't really, that, those were those tail end contracts where we tried to average out dollar values and we added year after year after year at $1 million or whatever the number was to reduce the average cap hit, okay? To me, those were just crazy and, and not logically useful other than to lower the cap hit. If you've got a, a, a player like Connor McDavid and you're extending a contract at the age of 21 for eight years, the risk that you're running is very, very minimal. If you're doing that for a 35-year-old, you're nuts. And you would never do that. Kevin would never do that. Mark Chipman would fire Kevin if he did that. 
Well, unless, he, unless his name was Brian Little, yeah. and then. <laughs> but I, I, I would like to have a dollar for every contract mistake I made as a manager. I would, I would not yeah. need to work. Well, but, but all those mistakes are made all the time, Brian. We we all make mistakes, and yeah, but uh, you guys don't pay for your mistakes. We do, uh, and that's we, why I never we, get mad. We we yeah. will never. I would never let my coach bring up money when he's talking to players. In other words, he could never say to a player, God, you're overpaid. We're play, paying you $3 million. I got one goal out of you. They were never allowed to bring that up because if a player's overpaid, it's my fault. It's our fault. It's not the player's fault. And you look at Louis Erickson, who's struggling right now. Everyone hates him. He's a pretty good hockey player. Everyone just hates his contract. Yeah. Yeah. He's a pretty good guy, too. All right, let's talk about escrow. This is a big problem for the players. First off, explain maybe quickly how it works, Anton or sure. Gil. And then what do we do about it? Well, uh, I guess there's a variety of things that can be done about it. But the, the way escrow works is, the, I'll use the example again. There's a million dollar contract that, that I've got as a player, okay? And the natural assumption would be that in a, in a non-cap, non-escrow world, I sign a contract for a million dollars, but and, and I get paid a million dollars over the term of that contract. The way the system actually works is if I've got a million dollar contract, I actually have a slice of not just my team pie, I have a slice of 1,000 or 1 million points of a global league pie. And at the highest level, we have what's called HRR. And th those are all the dollars that fit into a, into a pot. It stands for hockey-related revenues. Which is called hockey-related revenues. And it's a defined term in the collective bargaining agreement. It, you know, we can argue about whether it includes all the revenues or it doesn't, but it is a defined term and it is what it is. So if that pot now has $4 billion in that pot, okay, it gets split right off the bat, 50-50, the owners retain $4 billion worth of it, the players retain $4 billion worth of it, or $2 billion, two and two. My math's not very good today. So we've got a $4 billion pot, two million, two million. At the end of the day, Contracts are negotiated during the summer, and it's a very complicated system that relate to a, an upper limit. We call it the cap, but it's an upper limit, and there's a lower limit, and teams are required to negotiate contract values between those two limits, and there's a midpoint. And the way the system works, quite honestly, is that if you get to the midpoint, and the midpoint is halfway between the upper limit and the lower limit, and the average dollar value of all the contracts that have been negotiated is equal to the midpoint, then the players will get $2, $2 billion because the numbers add up to $2 billion. What's historically happened is that the total value of the contracts exceeds the midpoint. And when it exceeds the midpoint, then uh, if the total dollar value of the contracts is $2.1 million and there's only two or $2.1 billion and there's only $2 billion going into the pot for the players, their share of that pot based on on the proportionate number of essentially points, the million dollar worth of points that the players have versus Sidney Crosby's $8.7 million worth of points and Johnny T's $11 million worth of points gets reduced by probably 5% in that example. So it's a recapture. To, it's a to, recapture. To reestablish a pure 50-50. Absolutely. And at the time the deal was negotiated, rational behavior on the part of clubs would indicate that half would spend above the midpoint and half would spend below, when in fact we know what happened is 20 plus clubs are well above the midpoint. So that's the, the recapture is a very large figure. Players don't like it, but there's a, an easy way to fix it, which is flatten the cap and short, shorten the range. Well, it's, it, there, there's probably a dozen ways you can fix it, and you can flatten the cap or shorten the range, or you can... Um, Send them to the minors. <laughs> well, no, that's not the way. Yeah, that's no, not they the don't. Way. They don't have. They don't lose escrow if they go to the miners on a yeah. one-way deal. Right? <laughs> yeah, you can't send everybody to the miners. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'd have no league. That, that, by the money. way, that, that's that's Gill's right. A player goes to the miners, escapes escrow. Exactly. So the couple guys that have been sent to the miners on big one ways are not complaining. No. No. Well, they're complaining, they but the they're <laughs> they're just happy when they get their paychecks. They're yeah. complaining less. On the first and the fifteenth, they're good. Yeah. Absolutely. There's two days a month that they're yeah. really really happy. The rest of the time, they're not happy at all. So, uh, I think there's a variety of ways, and 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 to me, the the uh, escrow is is calculated in in a particular way, and the caps are calculated in a particular way. Um, it's calculated in a different way than in the NBA, 
and the NBA has much of a less, uh, much lesser problem because they have an escrow system as well. But they calculate their cap in a different way, which to, to a large extent reduces uh, the likelihood that escrow is even going to be 1%, let alone 11.5%, because they do it in a different way. So there's there's a lot of formulas that can that can happen. I think one of the challenges that's going to going to occur in the uh, CBA negotiations is how do you rejig that? The players hate escrow. Um, they view it as somebody stealing money from their pocket, even though it's just really a formula in the CBA, um, and it's alleviated by a variety of things. And from an agent standpoint, quite honestly, my greatest concern isn't escrow. It's not uh, the 50-50 split, although all of these things can be negotiated. I don't think that the National Hockey League, and I'll be controversial here, does a very good job of maximizing their revenues. And I think there are things that can be done. There are easy things that can be done that the NHL doesn't do. Um, and, uh, and that example? Uh, generating revenue from just a shoulder patch or sponsorship advertising on the uniforms, which oh, Gary doesn't want to do. <laughs> you don't want to do it. It's money. <laughs> we don't. We don't sell heroin at the games either. <laughs> very, very different God, issue. Can you imagine? Very different issue. A jersey patch that says Ford. I'm a Ford guy. Yeah. On the on the Montreal Canadian sweater. I, 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 it's sacrilege to me. It's it might sacrilege be. to me. At the There's end not of the enough day, money involved for me to be interested in that. Well, but we have a lot of new owners who I'm sure are going to vote for it soon. <laughs> well, uh, listen, at, at the end of the day, there's going to be a, there are a lot of things that are changing in yeah. sports. And most of the things I find that we're doing in North America day, today were done in Europe 25 years ago. And, yeah. and, and that includes rink board advertising, <laughs> advertising on the ice and all kinds of other things, and jersey sponsorships, and they're now happening in the NBA and generating yep. huge dollars. And when the, the when we have what is notionally referred to by, by, or I don't think Gary actually uses the term anymore, but he used to use the term that we have a hockey partnership, okay? We don't really have a hockey partnership, but if we do want to view it that way, then the whole goal should be maximizing revenue, revenues. Uh, or one of the major goals is, and if we're not doing a good enough job of that, then we need to look at the system. The you interesting guys go online and Google Moto and look at their uniforms and yeah. tell me that you agree with this <laughs> guy to my left. You, you don't have to plaster them everywhere. Ten million dollars for a for a shoulder patch, yeah. you I'm turn not, down. Not interested, but I hear you. You know the interesting thing about escrow, and going back to the original question, which we seem to digress over the original questions a lot here, but um, you know, you they, they, to say <laughs> the oh, it's entertaining. We can job? no, no, the moderator's doing too good of a job, I think. But um, you know, the interesting thing is in the CBA, there's the you know there's this thing it's called an escalator that over the over the course of the CBA, you know, the players when they when they set the cap, there's a certain amount that's uh, you know you set it, I guess, for the future. We get our cap number essentially. Uh, we were sitting at the draft, uh, you know, right around draft time is when, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the league and the union, um, you know, come up with the, the cap and then they send it out. But there's a, there's a, a mechanism inside the CBA that, you know, both sides, you know, I guess some would have to agree on. And that's a 5% escalator um, that goes moving forward. So the cap over many, many terms or many, many years in, in the past, that full 5% escalator was taken. So if you think about it, they're talking about, okay, we're going to bank on that the league is going to grow X amount organically plus 5%. So, you know, as a team, then, you know, that's how the cap gets set. And like Berkey said, there's more than 20 teams, uh, you know, spending over the cap. So as you can see, it's very easy for that midpoint number to be exceeded, um, you know, because, again, it is, it was in, in a lot of years, 5%, uh, you know, inflated right off the top. In the last couple of years, you know, the inflation uh, uh, mechanism has only been, I think, you know, roughly one and a half, maybe 2%. And I think, as you've seen, you know, that's had a drag down effect on the player escrow. I don't exactly know what the, uh, you know, the, the escrow projections are because, um, you know, again, it's, it is all a bunch of, uh, you know, projections based on future revenue and, and the like. Uh, and, uh, but it has gone down over the last couple of years, but, but I in think large part because it's just been organic growth. And you know the uh, the escalator has been you know kind of depressed. Yeah, and 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 I think over the last couple of years, where the escalator has been, I think it was 1.5 percent yeah. rather than the five. The there's a direct correlation between the 
escrow and the reduced escrow because prior to that the escrow was around 15.5 percent right. and now it's down to 11 and a half but that's really just a reflection of the five percent down to one and a half percent in terms of the escalator yeah and it's a significant amount of money like with the oh. calgary flames uh we got back seven and a half million dollars one year and every team got the same on that it's not a it's not specific to your payroll did you keep that uh no our owners <laughs> did though no, <laughs> no um okay so you got a lot of young people in here they want to get into the player agent business what would your advice be i would say uh <clears throat> hook up with an experienced um contract negotiator whatever the sport is you want to be involved in and take them a player um, i'm often asked that question over 35 years of doing this people come up to me and say i want to be an agent and i say okay well you go find a player that can actually play and you bring him to me and we'll i'll do the deal and we'll split it 50 50. i only ever had one guy come back to me in all 35 years that actually got a player that could play and we ended up working together for a number of years so you're pretty mercenary, mercenary aren't you <laughs> well you want to get paid right off the I bat. mean, all this talk about escrow, I thought I was buying a house in the U.S. or something, but anyway. <laughs> Can I jump in on that one? Yes. Oh, uh, again? Yeah, I'm not as mercenary as Gil. I don't need to be paid up front. Um, but, but listen, I, I think no, at the but you can't. you can't be in the business unless you get a player that can play. There's no doubt. I, I think maybe Berkey was just talking about somebody well, wanting Art to Breeze be. Art was for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, there were there been a lot of guys. I, I think at the end of the day, I could be wrong, but uh, we're talking about young people who want to get in the business yeah. and develop the skill set that you need to have to be a good agent. And I've I've told people from day one that have asked me that question. I think law school or business school is the best training ground for working in this industry. Now you have to have a love of whatever sport you're going to work in, whether that be basketball or football or baseball, because you can't spend hours and hours and hours. And everybody on this table here works much more than eight hours a day doing the job that they do because it's a it's a 365 day a year, 24 seven type of job because that's what the expectations are. That's what the fans demand of Brian Burke and and, uh, and Kevin Shevel day off, and that's what our clients actually demand of Gil Scott and myself. So you have to be committed, but you need to develop the basic tools just like any athlete is developing their skill set in terms of what an agent does. And essentially, agents do a variety of things, but the notionally the, the most important uh, role of an agent is a contract negotiator. So you have to develop that skill set, and part of those, that skill set is developing what I would describe as analytical skills. And if you don't have analytical skills, you can't do this job. There's just no way. And who, was, who was your first client? My first client was Randy Burge, who most people wouldn't remember, but Randy was an undersized forward who was a ninth round pick to the Boston Bruins. Probably about 5'9", played for the Big Bad Bruins as a 5'9 guy. Uh, and he played because he was 5'9", but he had the heart of a 6'10 guy. Yeah, he did. He was a good little player. Yeah. How about you, Gil? Uh, my first player I ever represented was Nick Bastia. He was an offensive lineman, played for the uh, Hamilton Ticats, and he used to go back to Simon Fraser to Vancouver in the offseason. And um, uh, he, he'd become a free agent, and the Argos had fired uh dick shadow and uh, john barrow i think and russ jackson was a coach they fired age. him show my age <laughs> and he said whenever they hire whoever they hire how would you like to negotiate my contract and i thought well that'd be a lark that'd be fun i'll do that let me take you back to the movie jerry Maguire. there was a, a a sage old advice guy at the end of the movie i think his name was dickie fox and this is what he said you, you heard him on the analytical side and i'm going to tell you how to really get in the business he said his quote was this is a relationship business so you've got to be able to communicate and build relationships with people to represent athletes in my opinion chevy there's a whole bunch of people out there that want to be you they have no idea how miserable that is some days but they want to be you. what's your advice to a young man or woman that wants to be a gm you know, I, again, I think that uh, I get this call actually quite a bit, and, and you know, whether it's from uh, you know the speaking here or just you know running into people in the ranks is like, how do I get in? How do I you know get started? And and I think you know that's the key. And what what Gil just said is is, is resonates really well. You got to build relationships, and you have to understand that 
um, you know, you, you, you might not start right at the top, and that's got to be, you know, you've got to understand that this game, you know, might seem glamorous from the outside, and it looks like oh, the National Hockey League is, is, is all great, and it's, it's this, it's that, but, you know, the reality is, is, is go to the junior rinks, you know, watch the game, uh, talk to people, and, you know, again, try to build those relationships. Don't be afraid, you know, to go back to, uh, you know, the, the, the beginning of it all and, 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 and dig in. But, uh, you know, the interesting thing for me is, is I got onto this side of, of this uh, from being a player because of my agent. It's a, it's a funny story. I was trying to get a contract in my last year, and uh, I kept calling my agent all summer, all summer, all summer, anything, anything, anything. And, you know, I finally got a phone call from Butch Goring, and Butch Goring had been my coach for three years. Uh, out of the four years that I was playing pro, I'd, I'd gotten hurt and you know lost a step that I didn't have to lose. So my agent was having a real tough time trying to find a job. And I called my agent at the time and I said, hey, Butch called me and he offered me and he goes, take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't tell you what he offered me. He says, doesn't matter. Whatever he offered you, just take it. And, and that was really my start. And, and uh, you know, I, I took that leap and went from the playing side of it, uh, became an assistant coach at, at 24 years old and, and, and just, you know, again, uh, no job was, uh, you know, was, was, was too little at the time to get going. And uh, my first client, because I used to represent players before on the team side, was Frank Bave, hmm. who Bave. I fought the yeah. second day of rookie camp, and we've been <laughs> friends ever since. Uh, okay, we'll get time for a couple quick questions. And we are going to have Trevor and I will post a, a document we worked on together called Opportunities in Pro Sports. We'll have that on the website. It has addresses of the unions and the leagues and stuff. And it's a much bigger industry, and we're going to talk about it later, obviously, but it's a much bigger industry than just what you see. We do the team side, and the business side is dwarfs it in, in size, and it has way better job security. Trust me. <laughs> all the guys who are on the business side, when I got canned every time, they're all still there. So, okay, no questions? We got a question? Yeah. So this goes back to arbitration. Do you think hockey should move to the baseball style arbitration where they're, instead of uh, the team and the player giving a midpoint and the arbitrator choosing in between the yes. two numbers? You final go, offer arbitration. Yeah, final offer. Do you think, do you yes. guys, do you think they should move to that? Yes, but the baseball people wish they had our system. <laughs> I, I had a real simple rule. I only went to arbitration, I think, once in my career. Because I told the agents, if you file, we are going to arbitration. There will be no further negotiation. Once you file, we go. And so remarkably, nobody filed. We got everyone signed. I had Brendan Morrison, I think, is the only guy that took me to arbitration. And it came in exactly our number. I said, Brendan, if it's a penny over my number, not what we offered, but the, what we thought the arbitrator would do, um, I'm trading you. I talked, I talked to him the night before. I said, I'm gonna put your ass on a plane if that's one penny over the figure that I've set internally. And, but all the rest of them, you file, we're going. No further talks. You want to ask us out in the alley, then don't complain when you get kicked in the balls. <laughs> it was a remarkably effective tool at getting deals done. Now you know why Berkey and I haven't done a trade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, gentlemen. Thank we'll take a, what's a 10-minute break now, Carolyn? Okay, 10-minute break. Thanks, guys. Thank